Hey everybody, welcome to the 10% True Podcast. Quick message from me before you get stuck in. This podcast is free, so there's no advertising. I don't monetize it on YouTube. You don't have to sit through any annoying adverts, and I don't even ask for any money through Patreon. But if you could, in exchange for that, drop me a like, leave a comment, share my content, and if you're listening to the podcast version, maybe leave a review of the channel, that would be hugely appreciated. It will help me to grow my audience, which is really what I'm trying to achieve. Anyway, with that, I'll let you get back to listening. Enjoy. Danny, welcome back to 10 Century. Thanks for coming back onto the channel. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure, Steve. We, we talked last time um, about your... Uh, principally about your time in the F-105. Um, I think we might end up having to go to a, a third interview, if you'll agree to it. We'll see how we get on with this one, to talk about your time prior to that and after that in terms of F-101 and another Century Series fighter time. But one thing that you had uh, omitted to tell me uh, when we were corresponding by email, uh, and I found out by Googling you, was that you were also the program director uh, on the Tacit Blue um, stealth program which uh, some people will be familiar with. Probably quite a few people won't be that familiar with it. Um, so that's what I'm hoping we can talk about today. Um, so can we start then with how you got involved in that program when you first heard of it and what your story is in terms of your involvement in it? Well, I should be happy to, but first let me introduce you to Tasha Blue. This is the airplane and uh, it was built by Northrop Aircraft, and there's only one of them, actually, about one and two thirds. And uh, but I'll, I'll get into that a bit. But to to answer your question directly of how I got involved with that uh, is, is a bit of a story. Um, I have been involved with uh, cockpit design and involved with uh, introducing a program called Lantern, the low altitude targeting at night uh, system into uh, the various fighter aircraft tactical air command had in its inventory at the time. And that effort uh, sent me off to a school called the Defense Systems uh, College uh, at uh, Systems College at Fort Belvoir, Washington, D.C. And um, I've been going to church here in Beaver Creek uh, and uh, literally digging a ditch around the church outside the foundation looking for a crack uh, in the wall. And this guy digging right next to me, a guy named uh, Dave England, uh, was uh, digging and, and he asked me, Jarvie, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm going to TSMC. He said, what are you going to be doing after that? And I said, well, I really don't have a clue. Uh, and this is a school that prepares uh, people to become involved with leading uh, various programs. I was about, uh, oh, maybe a month before graduation from this uh, school. And I get this phone call from Dave England. And uh, he said, uh, uh, Jarvie, this is England. He said, uh, when you graduate from this college, you're going to be working for me. Call this number when you get back to Wright-Patterson. Do not tell anybody that I called. Click. And that was the end of the conversation. So I, I wasn't able to tell my wife. I wasn't able to tell anybody. So when I got back to Dayton and uh, went back to my office, I, I, I called that number and they said, report to this building at that door and knock. And so I wanted, it turned out it was in the basement, way in a corner, dingy corner. And I knocked on the door, person looked at me, said, who are you? And I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Dennis Jarvie. They said, stay right there. They shut the door. And, and that, and, and moments later, the door opened up, they brought me in, they had me sign a whole bunch of papers, 
And uh, that put me squarely in the classified world. And I found out that at that time, I was uh, programmed to become the second director of this program called TASA Blue. Uh, it had been started by a fellow named Jack Twig. And, uh, and, and he had been promoted uh, to full colonel and provided another uh, billet inside of this low observable uh, cadre of people. And when I showed up there, uh, there were only about 40 of us. And in that car, out of that office, uh, came to you uh, a, a program called Hab Blue, which uh, which a precursor to the F-117. Uh, the F-117, the, at that time it was called the Advanced Tactical Bomber, ATB, and uh, that became the B-2 bomber, came out of that office, and TASA Blue. So there were and there were some other programs in there too that I, I still cannot talk about uh, that uh, were uh, involved. And there's a small cadre of people. That was folks that are both military and civilian. The preponderous were civilians, a few military guys like myself. And also uh, com uh, our counterparts and mine, uh, my counterpart was uh, Steve Smith, who is a program director at Northrop. And, and he was the fellow that was in charge of uh, not only the contracts and, and cost control and manufacturing and all of that stuff that went on back at, at Northrop. Uh, so I was working back and forth with, with Steve Smith. And the F-117 program director was working very directly with Ben Rich building the F-117. And... Um, when I got involved, it was, all, it was in the May of 1982, and Tessa Blue had already formed. The initial contract signed by DARPA, the Defense Research Project Agency uh, in, in the Pentagon, signed a contract with Northrop to build Tessa Blue, build one airplane, well, one and a half, in, you know, in case you smashed up the first one, you got a, a start on getting the second one going. And, uh, and that was signed in 1980. And, uh, and by the time I got involved, Tessa Blue had already flown. I got there, as I mentioned in May, this first flight was in February of 1982. And so in, in, in about two years, they went from contract to in the air. And, uh, and the purpose of TASA Blue was a, basically a proof of concept aircraft. Uh, the proof of, tech, of the stealth technologies had already been proven by this airplane called HAV Blue, which was built by Lockheed. And um, they built two aircraft. Uh, I happen to know both of the pilots, uh, uh, Billy Parks and uh, Ken Dyson, uh, both have since passed away, uh, but oh, both aircraft crashed. But out of that, they were able to prove that the stealth technologies worked and you could actually make the airplane fly. You could, you, you know, they, they used to call it the wobbly goblin. But in any event, uh, Lock, Lockheed was awarded the F-117 contract uh, as a result of the test data that came out of have the, well, Northrop didn't have anything in the air yet at this time. And uh, the F-117 had a lot of facets in it. And so the radar energy that hit the aircraft will be scattered in many different directions. And hopefully very little of that would get back to the sending radar so that they could see it. Well, that proof worked. Northrop took a very, very different approach. As you can look at this model right here, you can see these are very smooth edges all around here. And it's got this long chine in front up here. But it, it, well, some call it a whale, but it kind of more or less looks more like a, a, a standard aircraft. Well, the curvilinear edges up here is, a, is a, of a Gaussian design. And, and that proved to be the technological foundation of building that aircraft. And uh, we were able to get this airplane's uh, radar cross-section, RCS, 
uh, as low as anything that you might want. And, uh, and uh, in addition, we paid a lot of attention to the air intakes are on top on this airplane. And we paid a lot of attention on how you treat the gases coming out of here. And this design not only hit the aircraft with radar cross-section, but also the radio emissions, the amount of heat coming out of it. And we had a big, built by huge aircraft, a huge low probability of intercept radar. It was three foot high and seven feet long. And that radar was a marvel in its own right, built by huge aircraft. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, Dave Lynch and uh, Jim Uphold, probably two of the key par uh, uh, participants in the creation of that particular design. And so the <clears throat> another radar looking for this airplane never saw that radar, even though it was broadcast. And the, the whole idea behind this particular airplane besides being a proof of concept that this design worked, and we proved that in spades, but the idea was to have a vehicle that could fly over what's called the forward edge of the battle area at 25, 30,000 feet, relatively slow, about 250 knots and uh, or so, and then look down at uh, armor that might be coming and the, and the worry at that time, this is in the 70s, uh, the worried about the 10th Soviet shock army coming through the Fulda Gap into Germany and, and, and having something that would be able to take a look at that and say, whoa, here they are, and, uh, and transfer that data down. Well, we also had a, uh, a data link that uh, we, were man we managed to hide. And I was able to hide that airplane in every way you can imagine, except visually. Hmm. I couldn't make it disappear. And, and, there, and, there was, and that type of a device was not invented until Rawlings created the cloaking device in, the, uh, <laughs> in those famous books that she wrote. So in any event, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the concept worked very, very well. We flew 135 sorties, sometimes twice a day, never had any serious mishaps. Uh, we had some incidents that we had to work our way through, but hey, it's a brand new airplane. And uh, well, that's not quite true. Uh, the... Uh, uh, oh, by the way, it was probably at that time the most unstable aircraft ever flown by anybody. So when Dick Thomas, the Northrop test pilot, took that thing off, uh, he he had to be very ginger on the controls. Uh, but uh, the the uh, uh, we worked out through what's called the stick breakout forces and the stability and control mods and all the control laws that went into that were very carefully worked out, but it happened to be uh, a series of computers that voted against each other on whether or not that input was true or you're going to obey it or not. And it came from the F-18. And um, the landing gear came from there. It had two carat engines that uh, that powered the, the machine. Uh, that They were right off the line. I mean, it, 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 that nothing was invented there. Um, and the actual airframe construction itself was standard aircraft design, but it had this uh, uh, stealthy techniques, not only the design, but it also had uh, uh, the radar absorbent materials that were uh, uh, created on there. And um, so, th but there were other, you know, the pioneers of stealth, there's the, the, we weren't the originators of stealth uh, by all means. Uh, there were, had been some work done by Ryan uh, aircraft that created these drones that flew over Vietnam. Many of those had some stealthy tech technologies added in there. The U-2, the SR-71 had uh, uh, some stealthy uh, uh, modules that were added uh, uh, to, them, to their designs. But we were the first ones
to work at all. Can I go back? I mean, there's there's a huge amount there, uh, Danny, to unpack. Um, can I go back then to your introduction oh, to this to this cell then of 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 thirty nine or so forty other individuals uh, in this basement building? Um, what um, level of compartmentalization existed then within that environment? So you're working with your counterpart at Northrop. Um, obviously, you have Blue, which is the faceted design you've mentioned. That's a very different approach. Was the Air Force sharing what Northrop was doing with what uh, the Skunk Works were doing? Was there a transfer of knowledge between contractors? How compartmentalized was that world? It was a complete brick wall. Matter of fact, if you were in uh, certain areas and uh, say the skunk works, um, there would be uh, 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 programs that would be going on uh, by Lockheed for the Navy. And there was no transfer of information back and forth that I was aware of. And the same, uh, it, it, it's, you know, so uh, that was early on. Uh, later on, we began developing uh, you know, people realized that uh, we needed to be able to increase the general knowledge of the engineering world uh, in these other countries, companies. And so we uh, developed a, uh, and this was all highly classified. It was top secret plus. And, uh, and you had to be read right into the program. And even within the, uh, the program itself, just because you were aware of Casa Blue doesn't necessarily mean that you were given access to it, the levels of uh, uh, low probability of, of the low observable volts were there. You know, how much infra, you know, what is the spectrum of the IR frequencies that this machine is developing and how, and how, you know, how close do you have to be to it before you can see it? That stuff was even much more classified than just the existence of the program. So there, within within itself, there were levels of uh, uh, of protection uh, in there. And the best we can tell, we were fairly successful at it. Um, uh, throughout the life that I, you know, I was aware of, I, uh, there were maybe one uh, or two instances where there were uh, tangential references to a machine like this one. Um, and, uh, you know, later on, there was other, you know, once the, the, the uh, uh, F-117 was flying a lot, people on the ground could see it. And uh, what's that? You know, and, and so they, you get all these stories of, uh, of what it is. But there was a lot of compartmentalization taking place. And it was a, towards the end of the time that I, I, I left the program in 1984 and was shipped off to the Air War College. And uh, uh, about that time, there was a, a pro, actual uh, a formal program to, to, to help uh, transfer this uh, information. Now, the what? proprietary stuff uh, of, of exactly how a company built this that's proprietary, you know, and that's that's how they make their money, and so so those were never told. What status then? You, you said you were the second uh, program director. Uh, the airplane was already flying when you got there. So, what status was it at when you took over? And what were your specific challenges then? What did you have to do to make it a success? When you're uh, building an airplane, it, it, you go through a series of sequences, uh, very specific sequences, to be able to get this airplane in the air to prove, or to give yourself some confidence that this thing is that you're not going to smash it up, and um, and so you go through first a taxi, initial flights, just to prove that the flight controls work and that you can you can actually land it, and then you go through what's called an envelope expansion where you start increasing altitude and speeds and so that you feel comfortable within the design envelope of where this airplane is operate, how high and the, the high and slow, high and fast, low and fast, low and slow. So you work within those four uh, boxes in that box in there, make sure it feels good. That was almost completed when I took over. 
but none of the program that of the of measuring uh, how successful the uh, stealth technologies had taken place yet. And so we that's when I got started involved. And I was involved with that throughout the entire uh, program where we tested uh, its infrared signature. We tested the radar cross section. Uh, we had um, uh, F-15 of uh, Kenny Dyson who flew uh, at Blue Flew an F-15. It test pilot flew an F-15 uh, to uh, see if he could see uh, Tassa Blue on, on the F-15, and uh, he, ne he never saw it until he could actually see the airplane. Wow. I mean, he was he, he was up. He was he was really close before uh, it showed up on the F-15 radar. And F-15 radar is excellent radar. Hmm. Uh, I read an interview in, in uh, I think, Air Force magazine with uh, George Molnar, I think was his name. Um, uh, it was General. He later went to um, Boeing, I think. Um, but he said it had the radar cross-section the size of a bat. Is that is that correct? Well, let's say that's that too big? Uh, I'll, I'll tell a story. Uh, and, and, and that's got to do with... Uh, um, uh, I actually was half blue. Uh, there's a pole we call it, uh, it's a, a specific design, uh, a pole that you can mount the model on and you can shoot radar energy at this model and uh, to test its uh, radar return. And uh, they had half of, they had half blue sitting on this thing and they're Looking at that, they said, "You know what? These numbers ain't working out worth a hoot." They said, uh, "We've we've calculated what uh, the radar cross section would be, and uh, we can't find it. Uh, we, I mean, we 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 these numbers are much bigger." Well, it turned out that uh, what they were looking at was an owl sitting on it. So they were measuring the owl. And uh, but in terms of what uh, in terms of what size uh, you know uh, is it a, a BB a marble or a tennis ball or a football I I'm not going to go into that I can't talk about that okay. but it's pretty small put it that way. In terms then of of your thoughts when you when you first saw the design of the airplane and when you first saw it in in the flesh, what what sort of emotions did it evoke in you? I, I think the first thing that I saw when I first saw the airplane, wow, <laughs> this is not the prettiest machine I've ever seen. Uh, I've flown a number of airplanes, and there's an old saying that uh, air, airplane is going to pretty much fly the way it looks. And if it's a really good looking airplane, this is going to be a fine machine to handle. And you're, you're going to treat this one like a lady. You know, as, as compared to others that are a little rougher, you know, you kind of have to horse them around. And uh, they're not always necessarily uh, a very gentle airplane to, to operate. Um, the pilots, uh, I knew all of the, uh, except the very last one, uh, Danny Vanderhorst, I never did. Oh, I met him, but I didn't know him when he was flying the machine. All the others said that the airplane flew fine, and uh, but that was not the impression that I had visually looking at it. Of course, I came to this machine, uh, this machine after I had been flying F-104s in Europe, and so radically different approach. You're obviously a pilot, um, so did you want to fly it? Was there any part of you that thought I, I'd rather you know put the pen and paper down and uh, put the G suit on? No, I'm not a test pilot. I, um, and and, and the, the people that were doing this um, are all experimental test pilots, and uh, uh, they've gone through the test pilot school, and they're they're very aware of you know they approach flying. Uh, now, I learned how they do it, but, uh, but I've, I've, I've never flown as a test pilot, not in this sense. So for, from an Air Force point of view then, which squadron or unit was responsible for this thing then? Uh, we had an organization uh, that was, again, 
buried uh, within, at, in, this is uh, here at Wright Patterson and at that time, um, uh, Aeronautical Systems Division, which no longer exists, has changed its name in a program called XRJ. And initially we didn't have any, we were just a program office and we had a direct line to the Pentagon. Uh, we had a limited chain of command in terms of, we, thought, we talked to our uh, uh, SPO director who was Dave England the program directors worked directly with, with Dave, but basically what he, Dave was doing was flying cover for us. And uh, we had a great latitude of what we were able to do. Uh, my direct orders were, you can do whatever you want to do except violate federal law. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's okay, you know, and so off we went. And uh, we didn't have to go through a long list of mother may I's going through this office and to the next office and coordinating with somebody else and so on. Our, our uh, chain of command was rather narrow. And, um, and so I spent, uh, at that time it was called uh, a, a DDRD &E, uh, up in the, in the Pentagon uh, and uh, worked very closely with the, the people that were the, the money handlers um, and, and the flying top cover and explaining of what we were doing to the Secretary of Defense and uh, to Dr. Perry, who is uh, the director of, uh, of basically uh, research and engineering at that time. And, um, and also to certain select people within Congress. Uh, our budget was classified it was, it, we, had, we had a budget, uh, but uh, it's nothing that you could be able to pick up a book and say, well, there it is. Here's the line right there. <clears throat> and who is the, the sponsor then, the overall sponsor of the airplane? I mean, so you, you, my understanding of the way that the Pentagon works is that you've got maybe a three or four star officer at the top in charge of whatever. Um, and he or she nowadays would sort of say what they want, and then you guys go away and do it. So who was your sponsor? Actually, uh, Dr. Perry was one of the key drivers. Uh, you know, that, that, that really gave us a top cover. And um, in, in, in that sense, as a sponsor, because uh, he was very, he, he was interested in, because... Stealth, if, when, when you build an airplane, you know, if, I always say that if, if the Wright brothers uh, uh, could build a P-51, they would have done that right out of the bat. But you had to go through this growth of learning how to build airplanes and fly airplanes and, and fight with airplanes uh, as, time, as time went on. And so there were some key times when you went from uh, uh, fixed gear and uh, open cockpit to all enclosed cockpit and the wheels came up to variable pitch propellers and the speed and the altitudes increased and then came about uh, uh, both the British and the Germans invented the jet engines and it came to jet technologies. Then he came to supersonic technologies. Then came stealth and it was a game changer. Uh, warfare has, it's not only the aircraft that changed, but the communications systems have changed. The, uh, the way you fight, uh, what you think about, and how you coordinate and all that stuff, is all changed because of stealth. And, uh, you know, so it, it was a game changer. And, uh, and Dr. Perry recognized, I think, what, what the potentials were there and was eager to prove that this technology would work once we proved it to work, uh, now I was eager to get this thing in production and get it moving. And um, uh, back in uh, the first war in Iraq, I, I think that uh, the, the guy named Peter Arnett was sitting in this hotel, the El Rashid Hotel at ninth floor, and uh, showing us pictures of all the shooting and all of that stuff. And then he, he heard that. Uh, Boom, all of a sudden, there's a, you know, 
the radio went off the air, TV went off the air, and uh, speculated that was a cruise missile. That was an F-117. And the pilot who flew that aircraft said, as he was going in, they were shooting all over the place. And he's, he's sitting there saying, boy, I hope this thing works. And he, and he put that bomb right smack down in, in, into the uh, 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 smokestack and blew the place apart. And on his way out, he said, you know what? This stuff works. <laughs> Actually, that was the proof of the pudding right there that, that it worked. You, you, you mentioned that you were able with this aircraft to um, address those low observable challenges for all the multi-spectrum with the exception of the visual spectrum what what was the reason for that why would you also not have been looking at um you know sort of clever systems that can use lights and and that sort of thing to make the airplane appear more like the background against which it was sitting we tried we tried lighting we tried different paint schemes uh you know but uh I don't care what color you put, you paint an airplane. When you get them out there, you know, line of breast maybe a mile away, it's going to be a black dot. And, <laughs> you know, I've flown enough fighter aircraft, and, and uh, that uh, when when uh, General Creech said uh, when I was down there briefing him, uh, his aide was uh, uh, at that time. Uh, uh, the Colonel Joe Ralston, well, Joe later on you know, became a four-star general. Well, I'd known Joe as a lieutenant. We'd flown F-105s together in, uh, at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. And uh, so Joe and, and, and Joe flew sorties up over North Vietnam like I did in the F-105. So and, and General Creech is a consummate fighter pilot. He'd been flown you know, in, in several wars. And so he, he knew what he was looking at. And, um, and, and what he was worried about uh, on specifically Tessa Blue is that uh, because of this vulnerability, sitting just lo loitering in this orbital pattern, using this marvelous radar to gather information and to pass that information down to the ground control centers uh, in real time, uh, he, he thought that was a great idea, but he was concerned about this MiG-21 pilot that had been, came across the border, struck his target, just coming back home and said, hmm, what's that? Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and that's the end of the hunt. You know, now he's poked your eyes out. And, uh, and, and so that's a problem. So what the Air Force chose to do, the, many years ago, before this started, well, part of this started, there was an Air Force ever called the uh, Assault Breaker, which was a program to basically do this operation of having somebody orbiting uh, the, the forward edge, maybe back a little bit, uh, or and uh, what the Air Force wound up doing was uh, buying eight uh, used American Airlines uh, uh, 707s, and they reconverted that to the great big radar and they shoved that thing back a hundred miles. Well, the disadvantage of that, you can you can operate safely because if a MiG is going to come after you, you can just turn them and, and fly away. Uh, but at the same time, your look angle is masked by a lot of the mountains, so you you have to see them further away before you know where I was able to sit right on top of them, and look at them right there, as well as way over there. And that radar was as good, good enough where I could come pretty close to telling you what kind of vehicle it was. I mean, the, the, the capability of that radar was enormous. And of course, this is a long time ago. This is 1980. You know, we're 40 years since. So, so did, was that radar on both sides of the aeroplane then? So you, it could do its circuit and transmit well, from this, the side? This, this one only had one radar. Uh, but the, the idea was to have one on either side uh, mm -hmm. so that you could, you know, work both ways. And um, uh, but the proof, you know, just we were just trying to prove the idea. And, uh, you know, this airplane was never meant to be uh, put into production as as that 
uh, airplane look, you yeah. know, we're going to have to make some significant mods. What, what about um, this uh, data link you talked about then? Um, data links were, you would um, you would have sort of been familiar with them from, you know, F10, F101, presumably you, you had that F102, some kind of, say, is it Sage was the data link for um, air to ground intercept. Um, so data links as a concept weren't new. Um, what was special then about the one that you put into this airplane? Our, our data link was not a command and control data link where we were receiving air, you know, information from the ground and all that sort of thing. It was, um, it was, the, the one that we built was specifically to transfer data down. That was it. That was only, once again, it's a proof of concept aircraft. You know, so how it could have evolved or could have evolved over time. We never got to get to that point. So what about the ground component to this then? Um, you've said that you you got to the point where you could almost identify what sort of target it was. What were you actually doing? What sort of tests were you running? Did you have actually, did you get the army to come in with a bunch of tanks and armor fighting vehicles and get them to drive them around? Was it static tests? Um, how did you actually test? Because this was also in broad daylight. So having established that um, you don't really want people to see the airplane, um, you obviously want to be able to test it in the daytime without it being seen, but, but at the same time in, in realistic scenarios. You know, we didn't, uh, we, we did not fly the airplane at night. And uh, so you're right, it was, it was full of the daytime. But yes, we had vehicles on the ground uh, to, to be able to, to verify that our uh, modeling was, uh, was accurate or, you know, pretty close. And, uh, and so, yes, we did. So, so did you do that at scale then? Did you do that with just sort of four or five vehicles or 50 vehicles or 100 vehicles? That part of it, I, I, I flat don't remember anymore, Steve. Okay. okay. Um, and what about then what the radar was supposed to do? So was it were you intending to be able to get to a point where you could, uh, let's say, uncooperatively identify a target on the ground? Was it just Well, about- we never got to that. Uh, we never even got to the point of being able to uh, get to that question. Uh, what we were trying to do is verify that the technology used to be able to do that sort of thing uh, uh, could be hidden. Uh, and, and so what we were really, really focusing on was, uh, can we hide the airplane? Mm-hmm. And will, will this l- l- low probability of intercept radar actually function properly? And can, while it's functioning, can we keep it uh, so that uh, people can't see it and see the fact that we're transmitting and, and, and that's the part that we are really focusing on. Uh, there's no doubt that the uh, uh, technologies, the technologies are never static. You know, there's good, there's constant improvement uh, going on. And so there would have been advancements made to that radar that would have uh, uh, improved its uh, capability as, as time went by. But we never got to that point. We never were able to, uh, you know, come close to verifying that you, you you referenced earlier some clever stuff going on with the exhaust then can you talk about that were you adding chemicals um what, what were you doing to reduce the infrared um signature of the airplane uh part of it was the uh the curbal nature of the uh the the, the actual uh i think i got a, a drawing of it in here somewhere that um Talks about the actual. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to see this through light. Um, <clears throat> the air, when the air comes into the engine, it goes uh, at, at the top. Uh, the, the airflow goes down through the motor, uh, and then it goes back up. And, uh, and 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 comes across what we call a platypus, and th- th- we had that tree that surface is treated, and so that uh, uh, the air was quote relatively cool as it was uh, departing the aircraft, mm-hmm. and so the, there are surface treatments and, and angular, so the, the the exhaust didn't go straight out the airplane like you see on a 
on, on a lot of dead ends of the, you know, just boom, right off the back. Ours went up and and they gave it time to cool up. No, did they have an impact on thrust? Sure. You know, but it was good enough. <laughs> we could get it in the air and it would, it would get to the speed that we're looking for. And, uh, and, and that's all we needed. We didn't have, you know, we weren't going to turn that thing into a Mach 2 uh, machine, you know. <laughs> but what about uh, noise then? Because you said it was going to fly at 25, 30,000 feet, which I guess, I mean, an airliner you can hear going overhead, can't you? But it's not too noisy. Um, did you have to think about the noise um, profile, the noise, the noise sort of uh, signal? Uh, the acoustics? Uh, yeah, the, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, we did think about that, uh, but there was uh, uh, the the uh, well, the Garrett aircraft, the Garrett engines were uh, particularly huge, powerful engines anyway. Uh, in, in terms of uh, it's a ambient noise, it's compared to you know, because we know that uh, in World War II there were huge. Uh, Devices used to be able to listen, to listen for aircraft. Uh, I don't know how much those are being used these days. Uh, you know, so we, we paid attention to it, but if the aircraft is up at 30,000 feet, you know, it was, it was pretty quiet. If you're working in an environment where there's noise in the ground, driving a tractor or, or, or whatever, you're, or, in a village environment where there's other vehicular traffic or people talking, you know, the chances are probably pretty low that you'd be picked up. If it's not a silly question, did you ever go and actually watch it fly? Did you go? Oh, yes, I did. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to miss that. Well, I, I watched it take off and land. Uh, I didn't go out uh, to the, uh, to the test sites because that would, you know, that would have been kind of a well. I spend my day doing that. <laughs> I got other things to do, and so. But yes, I did go see a fly. And what were for you then the key challenges? What what sort of pushed you um, about it? I'm assuming that it was um, it, that it called on your all of your skills and experience. But what was most notable for you as as a challenge? Looking for or, or trying to solve the anomalies and the data, the test data, and just trying to scratch your head, you know, a certain frequency band, uh, you know, you'd fly two or three times and the data would be low. Then this other next time you go up and you look up, you see this bump and this glitch in there. You say, what, you know, what's causing that? And so you spent the, you know, we had people spending a, a lot of time going over the surface areas of the aircraft physically to uh, try to figure out what was what was going wrong, and uh, and, and that's probably uh, where I spent most of my time was uh, worrying about uh, you know, trying to figure out how to keep this thing hidden. But that's that's on the on, on the technical side. Uh, the other side of the where I spent a fair amount of time was uh, trying to keep our leadership in the Air Forces and the, the user was going to be Tactical Air Command, General Creech, keep him uh, up to speed on the progress that we we're making and, uh, and, and our concept of operation of how we had planned to use a machine to integrate it into the existing forces within the, uh, within the military. Uh, one of the things we were thinking about was uh, if we have a classified program and all of a sudden this organization is getting new data, you know, these people ain't dumb. They're going to wonder where's this coming from. So how, how do we mask that? And, uh, and so uh, especially if you're dealing with, going to be dealing with a relatively small number of uh, vehicles uh, as compared to uh, building several wings of fighter aircraft, you know, it's kind of a different story. Uh, uh, we wanted to keep it keep it classified. Well, how do you keep it classified? If nobody knows you're there and uh, nobody sees your data, well, what's the point of that? You know, so <laughs> uh, 
we face a, our problem was a little bit different than the B-2. Uh, the B-2, uh, we knew that eventually that, that airplane was going to start off as a, a, class, a totally classified program. We call it the black world. And, uh, you know, from neither light or sound or uh, it, it is emitted. It's just like a black hole. Just, you know, they don't even know it's there. Well, eventually the B-2 is going to have these huge airplanes parked on the ramp somewhere. And uh, you, so it's going to be impossible. So we were we worked through a transition phase of that one, that particular machine to first announce its presence and uh, and so on. Well, that was never the intent on Tesla Blue in terms of our concepts of operation, but we never got that far uh, because the program got canceled in uh, May of 1984. And, um, and, and so uh, those, those ideas uh, may have been passed on to some other program. I'll never know, uh, but it, it was sure dormant uh, by the time I got, when I was finished. So, so just be really clear then uh, to make sure I've understood this. So, so Tacit Blue was always intended to be a a demonstrator of of technology and of capability, but there was going to be a follow on aircraft that would be yeah, operational. exactly. If there if there would if there were, Tacit Blue, hopefully, you know, my hope was that it would would transition this demonstrator model into an actual platform that would be delivered to the Air Force as a reconnaissance vehicle. That was, that was certainly my aim and, and, and uh, what I was uh, driving towards. And, uh, well, I didn't do so hot. <laughs> well, well let's, can we talk about that a bit then? When, when did you first hear then that the program was going to be canceled? And, and what were your thoughts on that? Well, my first thoughts were rats. Uh, but but it was after uh, I didn't know right away that it had been canceled. Uh, as it turned out that uh, I think the uh, on my father's uh, birthday, uh, hmm, boy, does that bring back memories? March the twentieth, nineteen eighty-three. Uh, I was in the in the room with myself and uh, a, a young engineer, radar engineer. Uh, Terry Tucker, uh, and with General Gabriel, who's the chief of staff, uh, uh, General uh, uh, Brown, who's the chief of systems command, uh, General Creech, who's the commander of their tactical command, and uh, General McMullen, the uh, three star, who is the chief of uh, the aeronautical systems uh, division at Wright Pat. And I gave the program briefing. There's all these very high-ranking decision-making generals and me. <laughs> and uh, that, I think that that, that particular program, that, that meeting, I, I never got a formal answer from them because you never do. Uh, but they, they certainly were, uh, uh, General Creech at that time, I know was concerned about the visual aspects of being able to see the airplane and take it down. Well, he strongly supported the continuation of the program because the technologies of the Tacit Blue went very directly into the B-2. And if you look at the front of the B-2 from the side profile view of the, of the nose design, you'll see the, the parental lineage to Tacit Blue in there. And, the, and it just turns out that that high probability of intercept radar that's in the uh, Tacit Blue built by Hughes. Well, guess who built the radar for the B-2? Hughes Aircraft. And so the technologies were, were, were the same company. It was shipped right in. Kent Turtle was the uh, program uh, director on, uh, on the B-2. And, you know, I, well, he's since gone, uh, Irv Wallen, uh, who's still among us, uh, was heavily involved at Northrop on both programs, the P2 as, as well as uh, TASIP. What are your thoughts then on the decision to, I mean, I, I mean, can you even pass judgment on the decision to cancel it if you don't know whether they actually just instigated another program? 
Well, you know, the, the Air Force uh, continually, uh, you know, they, they have to make all kinds of choices all the time. And uh, was it a bad choice? Like, likely not. Um, you know, and the reason is the battle that filled the gap never occurred. You know, we had this president that went up there and said, Gorbachev, take this wall down. And, uh, and so the, the, you know, the Soviet uh, empire crumbled and the, th the threat disappeared. Now, other threats have come into form. Would this be helpful? Possibly. But the, the nature of warfare itself has changed uh, significantly. We were worried at this time frame of large numbers of uh, track vehicles heading into specifically into Germany, into Europe, and, uh, to, and try to build time to be able to allow time for our you know, the NATO forces to be able to respond to what might be coming. That's disappeared, that, you know, by, by, you know, by, you know, the threat has changed uh, instead of a bunch of track vehicles that may be some other way, but who knows? Uh, but at the time I was, you know, I was, oh geez. But at the same time, I also know that the Air Force is continually working on other systems and who knows what's replaced them. You know, the uh, uh, Global Hawk is a high altitude uh, reconnaissance program unmanned. We have the Predator now, which is uh, uh, armed systems. And those are big ones. But I also am aware that uh, there are other systems that are being built that are this size. You know, that mm -hmm. uh, they can fly down air ducts mm -hmm. and enter a room and be the fly on a wall. You know, I mean, who knows what's around? I sure don't. What was your cover story then when, when you were doing all this? And I mean, so take two examples. What did you tell your wife? And what did you tell other Air Force colleagues that you bumped into who knew um, maybe a little bit about you working in some strange place? Uh, I didn't talk to them. You didn't? I disappeared. What, as, what did you what did as, you put on your CV then, your your professional CV or whatever the Air Force equivalent of a CV is? What went on there? Didn't have one. Doesn't don't you have uh, an Air Force record? I mean, when you when you went to your next assignment, didn't the Oh well yeah, I have an Air Force record, but it just you know, it, it had uh uh it working on a class Y program and and, and and that that was it. Really? Uh, in terms of what I told Becky, I didn't tell her anything. Uh, matter of fact, we had a party here at the house uh, uh, one time, and um, we had uh, uh, Steve Smith was here from Northrop, and Herb Waller was here from Northrop, John Cashin, who's a consummate uh, 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 RCS guy, was here. She had no idea where these people were. I just introduced them to Steve, this Earth, this John, and uh, we had cooking hamburgers all back, and and uh, and, and we we just never told anybody. I went to, and when we <clears throat> would fly out to uh, Los Angeles, uh, we typically tried to uh, take different airplanes, uh, and uh, but if you're all on the same airplane, you didn't acknowledge each other. One time I happened to be sitting uh, behind uh, uh, our, our esteemed leader, uh, Dave England, and uh, he's chit-chatting with the person across the aisle, and, 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 uh, and, and the guy asked, uh, well, what do you do? He said, and so Dave said, well, I'm an undertaker. <laughs> Just make it up. <laughs> so we had we had cover stories, but I I was I never able to tell Becky that I was going to Northrop. Uh, I was never able to tell her that I'm going to be staying at this place called a cockatoo. Uh, you know, but, but I uh, you know so I, I would just disappear. But I was traveling a lot, uh, not only 
of West, but also, uh, you know, back to the Pentagon or to uh, Langley. And, uh, you know, so I, you know, I was, I was on the go a lot. Did you, the, the that sort of counterintelligence piece then, not, not, um, acknowledging each other on a flight that kind of stuff was that sort of a, a bit um well let me, let me let me ask a a different way was do you think that was necessary was there a, a threat specifically to this cell of people involved in 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 low observable research and technology or was that just a general sort of good tradecraft type of thing to do well i'll put it this way we had the uh, uh, osi uh, the Office of Special Investigations, right, intermingled right with us. Uh, we were getting our guidance from them, and they they had their fingers out in their field for uh, you know, uh, what I would call the human intelligence against uh, to us, and uh, and so we were very careful about what we uh, spoke about on the phone to anybody. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I'll put it this way: uh, we we had uh, a pretty good feel for uh, you know how how well we were hiding ourselves, mm. and that was through the OSI. And so it wasn't something that we dreamed up; it was passed on to us. Was it a particularly satisfying um, part of your career? Obviously, it's quite a change from the sort of cut and thrust of flying F-105s over Vietnam and then sitting nuclear alert with the, the Italians and the, the, you know, the Belgians, whoever else you flew the 104 with. Did you come away from it thinking it was a good experience? I came away thinking that this is probably one of the most significant experiences in my life. Uh, I got introduced to people like uh, Dr. Teller. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's, some, some of the brightest minds in the country. And I, when I was with these people involved in developing, helping develop this technology, I often thought, how in the heck did they ever pick me to come in here? I mean, why me? These guys are geniuses and that ain't me. <laughs> it's, you know, so it was a, a very gratifying experience. Matter of fact, we still meet from uh, socially uh, from time to time. Our, our, uh, our numbers are diminishing very rapidly uh, because of the age of people. And, uh, and so I'm right now involved with, a, uh, with the whole of the pioneers itself to uh, create a memorial over at the Air Force Museum uh, garden. And, uh, and we're, a matter of fact, going for a down select right now. We've pulsed our membership asking them for their ideas and what they would envision for a model to look like uh, a monument and the inscriptions that you might like to see uh, that would be left there for future generations, people 1,500 years from now go there and, uh, and, 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 and realize that there was this group of pioneers that created these stealth efforts. And we're trying to create a monument, a memorial there of some significant size that the people that would come to see it would say, wow, those guys did that? And draw them into the museum because inside the museum, there's going to be the opportunity for posters and displays, books, uh, hand models and so on. Outside where it's windy and snowy and rainy, they're going to be out there for just a few minutes, gather around, but we want to see if we can capture their attention and draw them in. And, uh, and so I'm involved with doing that. That's bringing me right back to these same, very same people uh, that uh, I've been talking about. <laughs> on, on that note, then, and because whenever I say my last question, I never, uh, I can never really stick to that. So, but this is a curious point. Um, and, and I'll go off on a tiny bit of a tangent and then come back to an actual question. But there's a, there, there certainly was a, um, a historian at the Foreign Technology Division, or, or NASIC as it's now called, um, National Air and Space Intelligence Center at wright Pat, who, um, because his job is to capture history, was aware, of course, of the age, uh, the advancing age of some of you know, people in programs that were still classified. And, and he went through the process of um, conducting classified 
his, historical interviews, if you will, a bit like this, you know, just sitting down with someone with the approval from the authorities and, and talking through something and then presumably sticking it on a tape and putting it somewhere in a vault until it gets declassified. And you said right at the beginning of this conversation that in that cell of people, that 40 or so people, there was the advanced tactical bomber, there was Hab Blue, there was Tacit Blue, and then you said there were a couple of other things that are still classified. Is there any initiative? Um, so two-part question, Denny. So, so the first thing is, those things that are still classified, do you see there being the potential for them to ever be declassified? Um, and then the second part of the question is, has anybody come to you and said, well, look, let's talk about some of the classified elements of Tacit Blue, because I understand there are still some things that are not declassified um, and let's get them down on record so that when they are declassified people can um, you know listen to you talk about them well uh, in terms of uh, people coming to me no uh, they haven't but we did have we were interviewed uh, well probably 20 years ago uh, formally uh, uh, by the Air Force to capture our stories, and and, and, and that was done. Um, it, was that as part far as a, I'm sorry? Sorry to interrupt. Was that part of the declassification? Because this was declassified in '86. Is that right? At '96, sorry, no, not '86. '96. Well, then, well, in terms of uh, yeah, that's about when the Tassa uh, Blue was brought out of the behind the cloak and brought into the museum. We had a form, formal program to uh, do that. There are still portions of the, uh, of the program that are still classified and, uh, you know, that I, I, I won't even uh, point at. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, uh, as far as the other systems that are still, uh, still classified, a couple of comments. One, the Air Force structure has changed. And, uh, and, and that is the office that, uh, that we used to report to uh, for to a classification of 40 of this level or that level or to change it or whatever, that, that no longer exists. It's gone. Uh, and so uh, how I go, you know, our organization might go to uh, declassify some of these uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, some of them may just die in a bind. There's a uh, uh, one particular program we've been uh, verbally uh, working with our uh, senior leaders that we know who are still tied in with uh, the leadership of the Air Force and trying to get you know some of these programs declassified. Uh, some of them we've been, I've been, been told you know point blank that uh, that one will never be declassified. Okay, well, that's the end of that one. In terms of the story and, and uh, you know, being able to um, have them tell their children what they were involved with. Fortunately, I can, you know, I... <clears throat> Um, Danny, I've got some questions from, uh, well, I think a couple of questions from some of the uh, members of the... Um, Discord group. There's a group on online. There's a place called Discord where you can go and have a chat about various things. And there's a Discord group for my channel, Ten Percent True. I just want to pull that up if I if I may, and just ask you uh, if I can find it. Said low. So he asked if it was just a single airframe, which you've already answered. You said one airframe and then a bit spare. What happened to the to the to the uh, sort of half or two thirds of the other bit that uh, of the other one that um, was built was built. Well, I, I actually really don't know. I'm speculating that they're probably just destroyed. Okay. He's also asked, um, was the jet assembled at Area 51 or was it flown in? Uh, no, it was a set near me and flown to right back. No, I mean, I assume it was, I think he's talking about the testing. So the testing happened in the, 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 the ranges in Nevada. Um, a, a test site there. Um, so he's asking, did you did was it flown into there from somewhere, or did it, I guess, go in the back of a C five and then get assembled there for the flights, the testing? It, it, it actually uh, from Hawthorne, uh, where the aircraft was uh, was assembled, was loaded on a on, on a big truck, and, uh, and and that turned out to be kind of an interesting story because the. 
uh, that they took off in the dead of night. And they had this uh, security team that left with them. And uh, unbeknownst to them, when they merged with traffic, they were literally right in the middle of a circus. <laughs> Seems appropriate. <laughs> so Vico asks from Wikipedia, Northrop's B2, Northrop's uh, B2 chief scientist, John Cashin, was quoted in 1996 as having said, you're talking about an aircraft that at the time was arguably the most unstable aircraft man had ever flown. Was it intentional to test something else? Uh, was that intentional? Uh, did they build it un- in an unstable way intentionally to test the flight control logic? Or was that necessary um, because of the way that the airplane was designed and, and how it was going to fly. Um, it, it, it was the latter. It was a, it just happened to be the way the aircraft was designed. And uh, matter of fact, if you took the control laws off, uh, and you put it in a wind tunnel, the airplanes go go around backwards. And uh, it was uh, it was very, very unstable. But that was just a result of. Uh, uh, the, the, the physical design of the aircraft. You only have so much room between the center of lift, the center of gravity, and and uh, and, and you've got this massive radar that's uh, sitting in there, the engines, you know, in, in, in the back, and so all the control laws that had to be uh, worked through to be able to make the aircraft stable uh, it, it was and it, that just happened to be the way it is. Hmm. And, but what John said was, I think, accurate. I've known John for many years. 